what you're here for today is for the online experience day. So what can you actually expect? We'll start by giving you a general introduction. Um, I think a lot of you will have seen some of this before, depending on whether you've attended an open day or whether you've seen any videos from LUC online, but every time someone presents it, it's different. Um, so you'll hear it from a different teacher who will put different emphasis, and you'll also hear from our students and from a wonderful alumna as well. Then we will have sample lectures. You can have a choice of three. Um, so have a look already which one you might like. Uh, later, we can also uh, drop a link in the chat where you can see the descriptions of these lectures. They are on our website. After that, we'll have a Q&A session with our students and staff. So you can ask all kinds of questions and we'll finish off with, again, two choices. You can either join the deep dive on admissions if you want to know all about admissions, if you're already ready to apply or you still have a lot of questions, or you can join the virtual campus tour, which is on Instagram Live. Uh, the virtual campus tour we will later already uh, also place on Instagram. So if you want both, then you can uh, watch the Instagram tour later on as well. Um, so without further ado, I want to give the floor to one of our lecturers who is going to get you started on the introduction to Leiden University College. Thank you, Anne. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to this um, general introduction to LUC uh, program. I'm going to share with you some images of some of the challenges that we are facing uh, today the Ukraine-Russia uh, war, obviously, also recently the Israeli-Palestinian uh, war, droughts that are experienced across uh, the world and in some other places take the form also of uh, floodings and that affect um, us in many different ways, not only in terms of the accessibility to water, but uh, disrupt uh, transport systems, energy systems, etc. cetera. Um, we can also uh, refer to uh, gender struggles, uh, civil rights struggles, racial issues, inequalities that take many different forms and take uh, uh, the toll of uh, various peoples and en enrage a number of others and, and sort of a constant, one could speak even of a decade of mobilization between 2011 and 2021, more than 80 countries in the world experience uh, forms of social mobilization protesting against various forms of inequalities. And also the alternatives that we are looking for and the, and the solutions we are looking for for some of these challenges, so the most evident one perhaps is the search for alternative forms of uh, energy, uh, green uh, energy. So what we try to do at LUC is to look in a, an interdisciplinary uh, manner, uh, that means from various different perspectives, uh, at the global challenges that we are facing uh, in the world today. Uh, our program highlights five global challenges, peace and justice, diversity, sustainability, and prosperity. Um, these are not necessarily disconnected challenges, in fact, one could argue that all of the challenges are condensed in each other, but these are the entry points that we take and that help us organize our program. And I'll come back to this when I tell you a little bit about the, stru uh, the structure of the program, especially in the first year um, of the courses. Now, the four uh, global challenges are also addressed through the six majors that compose uh, our program. Uh, LUC program is a liberal arts and science uh, program. Uh, and in that, we have three majors in the area of the arts and three majors in the area of uh, the science. So a Bachelor of Arts or a Bachelor of Science. In the Bachelor of Arts, uh, uh, you can see at the bottom of the, of, uh, the circle here, uh, culture, history and society international justice, and world politics. And I'll give you a little bit of a brief of each major in a moment. In the Bachelor of Science, we also have three majors in the top of the circle, governance, economics, and development, earth, energy, and sustainability, and uh, global public health. All six majors address the five, four or five global challenges that we explore throughout our program. But I said that the program is a liberal arts and science uh, program, and that is a particularity because that means that it's not a program that 
it's focused or is uh, um, informed only by one discipline. Um, a liberal arts and science uh, program implies a more holistic uh, approach to education that emphasize that your learning is uh, through discovery and finding connections between the topics and the, and the themes that interest you. Um, the idea is that you develop skills to address the complexity of the world today in its diversity and the various challenges and uh, in, in a context of a very accelerated uh, pace. So the focus on complexity is not to find ready-made answers to these challenges, but try to understand from different perspectives and according to different actors how to address them and potentially engage in dialogues and in collaborations that would help us uh, overcome them um, at some point. Um, the program is also uh, broad, uh, but also in depth in terms of the specific majors and the studies that you do. So it's uh, broad in the sense that it offers various perspectives from the side of the arts and the, and the science and social sciences. But once you choose your major and uh, engage in the uh, methodological training, and by the time you write your capstones in the third year, you have developed in-depth knowledge within that specific um, that specific major, within that specific field. So the idea is that by the time you graduate from the program, you have developed both an attunement to uh, a multiplicity of perspectives, a broad uh, a spectrum of perspectives to address uh, the challenges that we study, but also some skills within specific fields that would enable you to uh, further your either academic studies in master's or PhD programs or professional life. Um, and this is a, a, another point that we emphasize through various uh, aspects in various courses, but also through internships. Um, the idea is that you can apply what you study at LUC to real world settings. Um, various majors and various courses have a range of practitioners that come and teach uh, with us. Um, most courses have, especially in the upper level, so at the 300 level, uh, have components of doing research that are applicable in real world settings, uh, either embedded in The Hague or addressing other specific issues that force you to try to put into practice what you're studying. Um, and uh, another aspect that is important is that uh, not only that you learn about the challenges and in the majors, the content of our uh, co courses, but that you learn skills that help you transfer to uh, take that knowledge and transform it according to whatever path you're gonna take. Um, I would be lying to you if I would say, like, I know what kind of works you can apply. I could, I mean, we can tell you and our uh, alumni uh, are going to tell you a little bit about their experience and what is life after LUC. But uh, the labor market is a, is a very unruly beast. So what you're going to be facing from now in the next decade or two decades, it's rather um, elusive and, and difficult to pin down. So what you need to develop are transferable skills, uh, professional and also intellectual in the sense of capacities to think and face the, the, the challenges and your own challenge to uh, insert and, uh, and, and live in very uncertain times. And so our program is emphasizing that capacity to develop those sets of, uh, of skills. And last but not least, the program has a component of global citizenship that implies that uh, a sense of uh, social responsibility, both at the local level and community level, because it's also a residential program, something that uh, our students are gonna tell you a bit um, in the second part of this presentation, uh, but also engagement in the city and, uh, and the wider, the wider uh, society in the Netherlands uh, and beyond. The college uh, is the Honors College of Leiden uh, University. It's uh, located in The Hague. Uh, it's a small scale educational pro program and it has a very international character. Um, the international character 
It's both in the composition of the students, but also in the composition of the staff. Uh, we have represented in the program over 50 nationalities, um, and in the student population, about 65% are international, and many of them are that with an international background. Um, the ratio between faculty, that is uh, people that are going to be teaching you, and, uh, and a student is 1 to 15, uh, and the average class size is about 20, 22 students max. So generally, in the classrooms, uh, you can expect to have a very dedicated uh, um, environment to learn, to learn from the teacher and the material you're studying in every particular course, but also to learn from each other and the discussions that you're going to engage to uh, in your respective uh, courses. The structure of the program, um, oh, the program is uh, structured in three years. Um, the first year is the, is the most uh, structured one and is the one that gives you uh, all the tools to actually face years two and year three, where you actually have much more flexibility to choose uh, courses according to your interests. So the first year program does uh, gives you the basis to to approach this uh, second and third year. Um, you can see here that uh, we divide the academic year into semesters, and each semester has two blocks. Each block is seven weeks of studies and one one week of exams or final assignments. Um, and in between blocks, you have two uh, a one week of a of a break. Um, one key component of the first uh, year program is uh, the teaching of the Global Challenges courses. And here you would have every semester two Global Challenges. In the first semester, Global Challenge Diversity and Global Challenge Sustainability. And uh, that runs between uh, end of August and uh, December. And in the second semester, that runs from February until the end of May, uh, global Challenge Peace and Justice, and uh, Global Challenge Prosperity. Then there are courses that are compulsory to all students in order to develop key uh, tenets of liberal arts and science education. Uh, you will have a semester course on history of philosophy in semester one, uh, and you would have two courses on uh, uh, numeracy skills. Uh, one is on uh, statistics in block one, and the other is on mathematics in block four. And in addition to that, you will develop uh, academic skills for uh, writing, in-depth reading and uh, presentation. And these are skills that are useful even if your mother tongue is English and, uh, and you think uh, uh, that, or your education has been in English throughout your life. Uh, writing for an academic audience, uh, dealing with uh, uh, scholarly uh, papers and, uh, and, the, and, the, uh, and the academic uh, research requires a specific code that you would learn in, uh, in this course, as well as practice the skills of uh, writing for academic uh, audiences. And then you have some space for electives. So in semester one, in block two, you can take your first elective. Uh, the electives are courses at the 100 level, so basic courses that can introduce you to the majors and or uh, other topics that we teach in the college, for example, journalism, psychology, or uh, uh, gender. And in semester two, you also have the possibility to take uh, uh, three electives. In years two and years three are the years where you mostly engage in your respective majors. So by the end of year one, you're expecting, uh, expected to declare which major, the major of your preference. And then in years two and three, you carry out the, the, those uh, study. Uh, you choose your major and you uh, specialize. There are also space for electives. I won't uh, give you now the, the, the whole number of uh, how many electives and how many courses per major. Uh, we, we can talk about that if, if you have uh, questions. Uh, but you can always combine a little bit 
uh, taking courses within your major and also courses that are not in your major, but that would fit your elective space in order to complete uh, your program of studies. In years two and three, you can also, uh, you also will have to take a component at, um, of uh, global citizenship and develop cross-cultural skills. These are courses that uh, count for 10 uh, credits and often run for a semester long. Um, you at the end of your studies in year three and most likely in the second semester, uh, you will develop your final project, your thesis project, the capstone, uh, that is sort of the, the end of your studies and, and it would be based on the project of your liking. So during at the end of the, your second year and during the first semester of your third year, you can start talking with different professors and uh, start thinking about who would supervise your project and with whom would you would like to work in order to develop uh, this final uh, project. Like I said at the beginning, uh, LUC is a residential program. Uh, that means that uh, we are located in a building at the city center of uh, the city of The Hague, right by the central station. Um, the building is uh, has uh, 400 uh, studio apartments, uh, and you can expect to live in the building in the first and the second year of your studies. By the third year, the students need to leave the building and the, the experience is that most of us, our students live in uh, different groups in, in, uh, in apartments they rent uh, across uh, the city. Um, some of you might know, but uh, The Hague is uh, known internationally as the city of peace and justice. It's a city with a high concentration of uh, international organizations, international NGOs, and a number of courts uh, that are all give a kind of a, a quite cosmopolitan flair uh, to the city. It is a very green city. Uh, it has a very easy access also to the seaside and a beautiful long uh, beach. Um, there is also the Peace Palace in the photograph in the background of, uh, of this uh, slide. And so it's also very likely that if you would like to do an internship, you can find uh, an organization in which you could volunteer and, uh, and, and develop some of those uh, internship uh, skills. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, the, the campus is located in the city center. Uh, there are other locations of Leiden University also around uh, the city center. We are uh, five, seven minutes walk from a uh, Weinhaven building uh, where other, uh, other institutes of the Faculty of Governance and Global Affairs, that is the faculty that uh, to which uh, LUC belongs, is located. Um, and there are various other locations in central The Hague that also belong to the university. Um, like I mentioned, there's a strong international student community, but I think uh, our student is going to be uh, more more uh, talking about that in in a, in a in a in a little bit. Now, what I can advance is that our students um, have many different uh, committees. There are various uh, groups. Um, they organize various uh, events. We have a uh, Dies Fatalis. Uh, we have a pantomime. Um, and uh, various uh, trips and uh, and uh, and uh, and acti activities. Um, the university, the the campus is also close uh, to the beach, which is lovely in uh, summertime. Uh, but it's also nice for a stroll uh, in in, uh, in winter when it's not miserable and, and uh, rainy. Um, on it, I think he. Yes. This is, uh, so uh, if if you have more que questions about uh, the program, I'll be happy to answer those questions uh, in a bit. But for now, I think I'm going to pass on the mic to Anne to talk about support at uh, LUC. Yes, thank you so much. We're experiencing some tech issues, so it's a little bit challenging, but we're glad that the people who are here are here. Um, so yes, one thing that really makes us stand out, I think, is that there's a lot of extra support services available. Um, we offer academic support. So stu uh, in the process of selecting your courses, but also your major, trying to figure out what major suits you best, 
There's academic staff members available who can guide you and also students from year two and year three. This is especially important if you compare it to uh, different study programs at Leiden University College. You have so much flexibility um, that you need a little bit of extra guidance. So we provide that for you. There's also a lot of social support available. The first two years you live in the building and on every floor there is a residential assistant. And the residential assistant is a student from year two or year three who helps you uh, foster a community environment um, and also make sure that they check in with you from time to time. So how are you feeling? How's the community vibe on the floor, et cetera? Um, and finally, we also have some emotional and psychological support available. The university has uh, psychologists available um, where you can turn to with some uh, basic questions. Maybe you're struggling with planning issues or you feel homesick. Um, if you have more serious issues, you can turn to them as well, but they will have to refer you to uh, an outside psychologist at some point. But maybe this is reassuring, particularly if you're coming from abroad or if you need some extra support or help. Now, before we introduce our alumna, I want to actually introduce one of our students who's here, Elena. She's been here from the start and we wanted to ask her a little bit uh, uh, to share her experiences. So maybe, Elena, you can introduce yourself. Where are you from? What major are you doing uh, for starters? Yes, thank you, Anne. Um, so my name is Elena. I'm Italian and I'm a second year at Leiden University College and I'm majoring in world politics. Perfect. So Elena, why did you actually pick LUC? Um, yeah, LUC was actually my first choice and kind of like my only choice. So I'm very happy I got in. Um, and the reason why this was so is that it had for me, a specific and unique focus on uh, the interdisciplinarity of subjects. So I've never been, I've always been a bit interested in everything. So for me, it was really important to continue this interdisciplinary uh, perspective when I study things. So for example, now I'm majoring in world politics, but still in world politics, we do a lot of sociology, philosophy, international politics. So the interdisciplinarity was really a key element for me. But also I think the residential lifestyle that and the residential community that we were talking about now is really important because with hindsight, I can see that it really helped me move in a smoother manner. So I wasn't just leaving home and then living by myself, but I would still had a lot of support and um, always people around me. And, you know, I've never... Uh, I've never really felt like I was completely with my own problems. And I always knew who I had to go to when I had those problems. That's really nice. And did yeah. did the college kind of meet your expectations or were there also surprises? Yeah, definitely the interdisciplinarity sometimes threw me off. Um, I was a bit confused, like, oh, but should I use like uh, philosophy terminology or politics terminology? But I think that's something that like, you get used to, you know, with time and like, um, you kind of understand that it's less rigid than maybe what you guys might be used to with high school. Of course, people come from different experiences, but in my experience, you really had to use a different language depending on the subject. Whereas um, what I'm experiencing here that you see is that you can be more fluid. So in that case, Although I did want interdisciplinarity initially, I was a bit like surprised by how it played out at LUC. There was actually a question from someone in the chat that kind of links to that. Mona was asking, uh, because the global challenges are separated by blocks and semesters, is there really a chance to view them as interconnected? That kind of links to what you were saying about interdisciplinarity. How do you view that? Yeah, um, I, I do agree that they they do connect. So the fact that they're separated by block, um, well, that's kind of more for a practical reason, but actually in class, you'll see that many times you, you when you will be participating in a discussion, you will say, oh, like what we discussed in diversity in the first block, or as we discussed in this other class, um, and actually like oftentimes the same topic can be recurring in different global challenges, but then kind of explore in a slightly different way. But then the challenge itself or the topic itself, for example, migration, uh, can be explored differently in diversity or in prosperity, depending. Um, 
yeah, depending on the professor and on the class, but definitely there's still a link between all those global challenges. And I have a really different question on my mind as well for you. Um, how do you like living in The Hague? Yeah, The Hague was actually another reason why LUC was my first choice. Because um, I think it's, again, a good compromise between uh, moving from home. And I lived in a small village, so I did want to go to a bigger city. But also, it's not a massive city. So um, there's a lot of possibilities, as we were saying, a lot of international organizations. I was able to find a job last year related to that. Um, so there's still a lot of the opportunities that a city can offer, also in terms of having fun and um just doing a lot of sports but at the same time it's not massive so i can reach everywhere in around 30 minutes especially because luc is right next to this center of the hague um so i can reach everything very quickly and also i never feel like completely lost i always know maybe i don't know one street but i go a bit further and then i'm gonna know the other street you know which at least for me it's very important because as i said i I was just moving from a small village, so it was really important to have some some sort of security. So basically, it's both big enough and small enough. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. All right. We might come back to you in a little bit, Elena, but I actually wanted to move on and give the floor to our fantastic alumna, who I saw also has joined the meeting. Um, Katrina, can you introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Katrina. I graduated in uh, 2019, which makes me feel a bit old. Um, and yeah, I mean, I can run you through a little bit of my story. Um, so I'm half British, half German, but I was actually living in Singapore when I was in high school. Um, so I did the IB diploma. And then when I was looking at universities, I had quite a few factors in mind. Like I knew I wanted to do something in the realm of international relations. I knew that I wanted an international college experience because I was coming from an international school. And I knew that I very much valued that kind of international perspective. I knew I wanted to live in an interesting location. Um, and I knew that I needed a school with a little bit of structure and support because, um, well, quite famously, I'd never been to the Netherlands before the day I moved there. So I was really going out of kind of my familiarity and my comfort zone. Um, so I was very keen on a residential program. So yeah, I did my undergrad in world politics um, and then I did a lot of things at OEC while I was there. So I chaired the LGBTQ plus committee. I then also chaired the diversity committee, which is like the umbrella. I was a student ambassador. So I used to go to lots of different Dutch high schools and talk about the program, which was super interesting for me. Um, and then while I explored a lot of different courses and a lot of different things, I really honed in by the end of the three years into my interest in not only world politics, but very specifically looking at things like cultural diplomacy um, and yeah, cultural diplomacy and what I then termed pop culture diplomacy. So that's what I wrote my capstone on. I then decided to go on and do a master's um, and I looked all over the world really um, and then in the end found that the best program for me was right next door. So I ended up staying at Leiden. Um, so what I really discovered during LUC and what was really valuable to me is that the international relations kind of department at Leiden is uh, quite, a, quite a modern, quite a progressive department. And it focuses a lot about theories of decolonization of like non-Western approaches to international relations, um, things like cultural diplomacy and uh, public diplomacy. So, so it was probably maybe a little bit technical, but like, so that was really my niche. And I was very lucky that I was able to discover that in undergrad because most international relations degrees at other universities wouldn't introduce you to these theories so early on. So I already was really able to hone in. And then I was like, okay, I really want to focus on this for my master's. Um, so then because Lion has such a strong background in it, it ended up being the right place to do the master's. And I did a master's in um, international relations, but focusing on culture and politics. Um, and then within that, I wrote my thesis on something called Mega Events Theory and looking at Eurovision. So I actually looked at Israel's hosting of Eurovision and how countries use Eurovision to present themselves to the world. Uh, so maybe not the traditional international relations that you're thinking of, um, but it was super fun. And then I also did an internship with Oxfam Nova, which is an NGO that was based in The Hague. Um, so there I was working on sexual orientation and gender identity rights. 
um, which really came back from the fact that I had chaired the LGBTQ plus committee when I was still at LUC. I know that that really was the reason that I was selected for that internship. And then because I was selected for that internship, once I graduated with my master's, I went on to do what's called the Schumann uh, traineeship program with the European Parliament. So then I left uh, the Netherlands and I moved to Luxembourg. Um, ended up staying in Luxembourg for two years, which was a bit longer than I had expected. Um, but it was really cool. So I did an internship with the Parliament's Diversity and Inclusion Office, basically, in the administration. Um, and I was very fortunate and they offered me a job afterwards and I'm still there. They've uh, moved me to Brussels. So now I've uh, I've completed Benelux. That's That's been my achievement of the last few years. Um, but yeah, so I, me chairing the LGBTQ plus committee, which was a very kind of impulse decision over the summer of my second year, uh, led me to developing an expertise in the topic, of course, um, a real passion for it. It led me to organizing a bunch of events, which then came in very handy for later job applications, stuff like that. Um, it was really a chance choice and it's led me into well, I guess now my career really. Um, so yeah, and I uh, sorry, I didn't properly prepare for this, but so I was asked what I think the benefits of OEC were for my work experience and for my journey. Um, and I've been reflecting on it recently with quite a few of my friends from LUC because I think there's really the two parts to it. So one hand is obviously the knowledge, like theories that we learn, the ways of applying them, very much this pro um, this emphasis on being interdisciplinary, being intersectional. Um, so the majority of people I know, we found our masters pretty easy to transition to. Like we already felt like we had a very solid background. A lot of my friends also switched uh, programs or fields a little bit for their masters um, and everyone I know found that pretty easy to do because we were already prepared to like be able to switch different hats on and off and think about different like subjects from a range of perspectives um, and then also very much the skills so obviously you know I know how to quickly write an essay I know how to do research but also LUC does a lot of presentations um, that's really a part of the program which a lot of undergraduate degrees actually don't offer so because I was able to do all of those presentations, I was able at work really easily to be able to start presenting in that context or being able to do public speaking. Um, so the second picture above is actually from Wednesday and that was me chairing uh, the European, well, it was an institutional event with the European Parliament, the Court of Auditors, the External Action Service, uh, the Economic and Social Committee and the Investment Bank. Um, and we do an annual event to celebrate coming out day. Um, and I was chairing that. So I'm in the middle between Stefano Sanino, who is the Secretary General of the External Action Service, and Kim Menschbantak, who's actually a Dutch member of the European Parliament. And well, I was nervous because it was my first time doing something like that, but I was able to quite comfortably speak in front of about like 150 people. And I think that's a skill that I learned in my time at LEC. Um, and then of course, like, you know, in day-to-day -day work, you know, being able to very quickly write summaries, being able to condense information and present it, all of these kind of things. Um, but yeah. I Amazing. Work. Thank you so much. This is actually a very inspiring overview because I think you, uh, with everything that you've done, you really showcase one of the many, 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 many routes that people can take, but how much benefit it can have to, to explore different things. Um, I also noticed that while you did a world politics major, you also have a link uh, very often with, uh, or you're very interested, it seems, in culture and, and in humans. Does that mean you also took subjects from the culture, history and society major, which was back then still called human diversity? Uh, yeah, so I did take a few. Um, I did do a lot of the, I can't remember the exact route it was called in world politics, but I did a lot of the cultural ones that were directly in world politics and then a lot of co-convened, as we call them. Uh, actually, one of my favorite courses was the history and politics of migration, which was, I think at the time, co-convened between what we called human diversity, world politics and international justice. Mm. Uh, so that was a really fun class because that was three very different kind of approaches that we came in with from like the IJ majors who would, you know, look at it from quite a legal, technical point of view to at the other end of the spectrum, the human diversity, um, who were very, you know, interested in kind of theory and stuff like that. So yeah, definitely that was, I mean, I think that was an important thing. I only applied to liberal arts style universities um, because 
while I knew that I probably wanted to study international relations and I did go on to that, I was also very aware that I'd never been to uni before. So how would I know that this was the right course for me? Um, and how would I know that this structure worked for me? So I even, in IB, I was able to do their, I think it was called Glo Global Politics, which was at the time like a very unusual course to be able to take. So I already had more of a background in the field than a lot of my classmates, but still, I mean, how was I to know what university would actually look like in the day to day? How did I know that this would be a field I really want to dedicate my entire time to studying? Um, so in my first year, I really did explore different things. I started doing as well with philosophy minor because I really like philosophy. Um, and even though I didn't end up fully doing a philosophy minor because of just like personal logistics, I did still take a bunch of philosophy courses, which I really enjoyed. Yeah, I think that also it, it speaks to what a lot of people here probably feel. Uh, a lot of students here are are about to make that choice of which university to enroll in, so they can probably relate to you. I see there was a question from Mona for you. How has the IB diploma prepared you for the academic workload of LUC? Uh, really well. <laughs> I, uh, I, yeah, it's there are obviously differences. Like there is a higher level of academic rigor of course within a university context um but IB does prepare you I will say quite well for university um we also I think you still have it we used to take an academic writing course at the beginning um which I found relatively easy but like gives you the crash course on like the different citation systems and a slightly different structure um but workload wise and kind of the type of work we had to produce I felt very well prepared from with IB um, Amazing. Um, I just heard from my colleague that you will be back for a little bit during the Q&A. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. Yeah. My day emptied. So I'm happy to come back. Ah, that's amazing. Because what we will then do um, is we will, I'm sure that students will have more questions for you and we will handle more of them during the Q&A if that's okay. Yeah. No, that works yeah. for me. Thank you so much for the introduction. Really inspiring journey. Um, I'm going to give the floor to Maarten, who's going to tell uh, the audience a little bit more about some other possible career paths uh, for alumni. Yeah, thank you, Anna. So hi, I'm Maarten. Uh, I'm an admissions and recruitment officer. Uh, Katrina basically told the whole story of LUC already. Of course, she's just one of the many, many examples that we have uh, at LUC as, as alumni graduating. Um, but the great thing, and maybe also a bit frustrating thing, is that no career path or no study path at LEC is the same because we offer so many courses, because everybody has different interests, of course. Um, so it all, it's always difficult to answer to a student the question, what can you become with the arts and sciences? There are many, many things that you can do uh, during your study, but also after graduating. So most of our students go directly do uh, a master's program after they graduate. Um, some people start a job immediately or do a traineeship. And even though Katrina stayed within the Netherlands, uh, we actually also have a lot of students going abroad after their masters, which you can see on the next slide is that we have listed several examples. Uh, you can go to the UK, to the US, to Japan, or as Katrina did stay in Leiden or in the Netherlands, for example. Um, so many, many master programs are uh, available for you once you graduate, but it, of course, depends on the study path that you have chosen during your stay here. Now, in terms of career, it's also the same. We have a lot of options or a lot of examples from alumni who went into a career or into a job um, in different study fields, right? In different academic disciplines, in different work fields. So we have, for example, it's just a, just a graph of the many, many alumni that we have. So you have an advisor in tropical health, right? We have diplomacy, a cultural heritage program consultants. These are just examples to give you an idea what you can do. There's lots of people that go into non-governmental organization work or uh, working for the government, but we also have startup entrepreneurs. So it's from every bit uh, uh, the same. Of course, there are teachers here and the career services at the university that can help guide you. Uh, but of course, we want to give you as much freedom as possible to explore your interests, right? Um, so that's it for alumni. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the serious stuff and I'm, I'm an admissions officer, so I'm also that person, right? Um, 
So for people that are interested in, in tuition fees, uh, you can see the tuition fees on the screen. So if you have a citizenship or a nationality that uh, from a country within the European Union or the European Economic Area, you see uh, a subsidized tuition fee that you pay yearly. For a student that has a citizenship outside of the European Union, there is a higher tuition fee per year. So if you have dual nationality and one of them is European, you can make use of that nationality to pay the lower amount of tuition fee. There's also a yearly campus fee uh, uh, for making use of the facilities that we offer uh, at our campus. You can see the rent. Uh, so the rent is for your own room uh, which is about 25 square meters uh, with your own bathroom and kitchen facilities uh, that you pay per month. And you can apply for a rent subsidy, which can be, uh, which deducts from that amount, right? So it's not the full amount that you see there. You can deduct some euro from it. And we also estimate that as a student in the Netherlands, you pay personal expenses of about 500 to 800 euros per month. But this is already excluding rent, okay? Um, and so for admission, so at the end of this presentation or at the end of the Q&A today, I will deep dive a bit more into how we select for the program. For, for those of you who are either going on the campus tour or uh, won't finish the whole uh, day, um, I will just give you a brief overview of how we select in our admissions office. So we have place for 200 students each year in uh, our building for first year students. And we have quite an elaborate selection process. So once you make an application to Leiden University, you'll be uh, tested on different components. And as you can see here that we split it up into academic fit. So how good are your grades in high school? For example, how good is your English proficiency? But also how much do you want to be here, right? So your motivation for the college is also very, very important. Are you ready to uh, engage in a program that is intensive? Are you broadly interested enough? Do you know what liberal arts and sciences actually is, right? Those are kind of questions that we ask you in the motivation letter. Um, and we also test your uh, willingness to engage in a concept such as a community uh, that we form here at LAC, right? We live, you live in, you live and learn in one building. And that's quite intensive, right? You live with many, many international students. So there is also a social aspect that we want to uh, test you on. Now we have two uh, deadlines, an early bird deadline and a regular deadline. So the early bird deadline is on the 1st of December. You can already apply to the program, by the way. Uh, the first is on the 1st of December and the second and final deadline is on the 15th of March. We don't select differently. Uh, 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 so we don't have different selection methods with these deadlines, uh, but the sooner you make an application, the earlier you hear if you have been selected or not. And that's always nice to know. Um, I think that's it, Anne or Anik. Yeah. Sorry, just the deadline. I realized that was... Oh. Yeah, so 1st of December, early birds, regular 15th of March. So if you want to, if you have questions in mind that you want to ask, uh, then we have a whole panel of people that you can ask them to. So we don't have a lot of room for breaks or quick uh, 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 stops. We just go on to the next topic right away. Um, so maybe this is a good time for our panel to introduce ourselves. So for those uh, people who were in a different lecture, maybe we can start with the uh, lecturers. Bernardo, can you introduce yourself one more time just for everyone here? Sure. So my name is Bernardo Almeida. I'm, I'm Portuguese, but uh, living in the Netherlands for many years now. I'm a lawyer by training, and, but what I do is mostly social legal studies, uh, mostly related with land rights. Perfect. And then we have Caroline. Hi, everybody. I am Carolyn Archambault. I'm an anthropologist here at Leiden University College. I um, do I work in development um, in East Africa, um, primarily, but also uh, uh, in the last uh, seven years or so here in the Netherlands. I'm also the um, global citizenship coordinator. So um, I teach a number of courses in the global citizenship program. So we'd be happy to answer questions related to that as well. 
Awesome. And then we have Martin. Hi, everybody. My name is Martin. I'm an admissions officer and recruitment officer, and I also am in charge of questions about alumni relations. So all of those things. So for the context, by the way, after the Q&A, we're also going to do a deep dive in admissions, or you can take a campus tour. Um, so all, most of the questions about admissions for the, for the latter part. Yes, we'll just do the basics, but the deep ones we'll save for later. Then I see Jill already. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jill. Um, I also come from Portugal and I am a third year culture, history and society major at LEC. And then I think we have Sebastian. Yes. Hi everyone, my name is Sebastian. I am a second year student at LUC. I am Dutch Colombian, but I grew up in Aruba and I do global public health as my major. And I think we also still have our alumna somewhere. Yes, Katrina, there you are. Hi, yeah, uh, I'm Katrina. I did well politics at LUC from 2016 to 2019. Um, and then I did a master's in international relations, and now I work at the European Parliament in Brussels. Awesome. All right. So I see that there are questions that came in during the beginning already. So we will start answering that, and I'll just ask different people in the panel to answer it. If you feel like you can answer it, feel free to raise your hand. Then I know who I can throw it at, and I'll try to divide them. Um, so a very practical uh, question. Uh, do students typically work while going to school? Jill, I know you work besides your studies. Yeah, so it is definitely a possibility. A lot of uh, students at LEC do work. Um, um, it's quite easy to find a job, um, in, or especially in The Hague, it's a very international city. It's very easy to find a job as an international student. Um, um, yeah, um, you don't really need to speak Dutch. Um, but yeah, of course it is challenging. It can be challenging to study alongside LEC. It is a challenging program. It is an intensive program. And so um, it takes time to get used to it, but it's definitely um, a possibility, yeah. All right. And then we had a question from Mona earlier. What forms do exams usually take? Caroline, can you talk a little bit about that? What types of exams and testing we do at LEC? Mm -hmm. Yes, although I, I'm afraid I can't um, I can't quite tell you what exams take because I don't think I've ever given one, um, at least the conventional type of exams, um, but I know they exist. <laughs> it's not altogether true. In the first year program, the Global Challenge courses often have a have a final final uh, exam type uh, assessment. But I think one of the things that we the LUC prides itself um, about is the variety of types of assessments. So, um, it, and, and these really take very different forms. Um, so of course you'll have conventional exams as you know them from high school, um, but you'll also have um, in, in uh, for example, in my courses, you'll also have uh, simulations or games that you've produced for the course as a final final product. Um, I know that, yeah, this is one of the things I love to hear about many of uh, my colleagues' uh, uh, new ways of, of doing assessment. Um, and I think the, the focus is on sort of how to give formative feedback um, throughout the process of learning and finding really like good creative ways to do that. Yeah, I think that's in that sense, it was kind of a cool question because we really do things quite differently here uh, at LUC. I think similarly, maybe a question for Bernardo. Would you say classes are more discussion based or lecture based? I would say they are more discussion based. At least I don't at the LUC, I never gave a lecture in which I grab my papers and I talk for 45 minutes. That's not what it happens at the LUC. So I would say maybe there will be one course in this where this happens a lot. I would say that discussion base is the norm. Maybe that's also a nice question to throw at Katrina because she already graduated. Do you feel like um, that teaching style at LUC, has it helped you later in your career? 
Yeah, I think so. So it definitely wasn't my experience very discussion based. I mean, I think it's always telling that we sit basically in a circle in the classroom. So it was always very much about discussing and reacting and also being able to build on people's ideas, to critique people's ideas. Um, and that's very useful. So you become very comfortable with advocating for your ideas, being able to quickly kind of build an argument, but also listen like when people you know, may criticize it or may bring in a different perspective. So I think it makes you quite, I guess, like mentally agile um, because you're not just being given information. Uh, and then my favorite thing was always that we were taught to challenge everything. Like I do remember classes where we did a reading and we came in and then we just dissed it for the entire two hours because none of us agreed with what the author had written. Um, and that's completely fine as long as you do that with, you know, an academic foundation, not just a personal dislike. So also being able to always think critically just because someone in a position of power gives you information doesn't mean you have to agree with it or that it's a universal truth. I really like that. Mentally agile, that's a term I'm going to remember forever. I'm wondering, Caroline, do you see the same in your classes that students will have heavy debates and they will also debunk some of the articles that you've, you've told them to read, for example? Yes, of course. Um, but at the same time, I think there's important uh, uh, that it's important that what you have assigned, you also take quite seriously. Um, so I think it's it's yeah, it's always it's always the temptation to find the faults of things. And so I think many of us start with trying to let let's let's see what we what we take from it first. But but most certainly, uh, I, I agree that we are trying to um, promote uh, critical inquiry um, and uh, indeed sort of multiple perspectives on on issues. So we've got all kinds of techniques, pedagogical techniques to bring those in. That's also a word I'm going to remember, pedagogical techniques. That's a really good one. Um, a question completely different, well, not completely different, uh, maybe for you, Sebastian, does the variety of electives for someone depend on the major? And if so, um, the question is, what, what are they for global challenges? But maybe there's a bit of confusion about the position of global challenges versus major. So maybe just for the basics, does the variety of electives depend on the major, Sebastian? Um, I would say that it depends because you have so many electives, you, courses that you can take within majors, but also outside majors. And these are just called elective uh, electives for elective spaces, um, which don't necessarily um, align themselves towards a specific major. So you have variety from majors, you can choose uh, from one major or another, or even no major at all. So you have so much choice and a lot of variety, I would say. Is there a major or an, uh, an, an elective that you chose that you really enjoyed, something that really stood out to you? Yeah, actually, and it's actually, it's not, um, it, it's not part of my major, which is introduction to psychology, which was so, so interesting. It's part of the elective spaces. Um, and it, it just like, uh, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with, with my major, but it still gives you a lot of information and knowledge that is useful. Maybe sticking with you for a second, Sebastian, um, was it easy to pick your major? Um, there, the answer depends on the person as well, I would say. Um, for me, for example, I was between two majors, culture, history and society and global public health. And uh, but for example, I know some of my classmates, they were set on a major. So they came here. But if you don't know which major you want to take, that's also completely fine. That's what the elective spaces in your first years are for, because you can take certain courses from certain majors to see if, if you like them. If you don't, it's completely up to you how, how you um, make sure the major you choose is the right one. Does anybody want to comment on that, add to that? Katrina or Jill? Yeah. If I that to that um like personally i also kind of knew that i wanted to take culture history and society because i was already kind of a humanities social sciences uh, kid in high school but i still questioned it i still doubted it and um and a lot of people um also have no idea of what they want to do uh, as a major when they come to lec so you only have to choose your major by the end of your first year and as sebastian said you do have the opportunity to take 
a lot of different classes. You take the global challenges classes in your first year, and then like you have the opportunity to take elective classes of your choice that also help you um, with making a decision. But then also um, there's um, study advisors that you can talk to, um, and and LEC is very small scale, so you can always um, you kind of get to know your your professors uh, from your classes in a more personal way, or um, you can go to their office hours and, and, and have talks with them about, you know, what you've learned in class and what your interests are. And that kind of also helps you. So I think it helps to think about it as it's your personal choice, but you're not necessarily alone. So there is a lot of support that you can get to also um, choose your major. Yeah. All right. Um, another question that came in that Naomi asked, um, Bernardo, I think this is a good one for you. Can students conduct research at LUC? Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, in a couple of ways, I, I'm thinking, for instance, for my class of international environmental law, the final, the final assessment is an essay on a topic that the students choose. So they conduct research for their final assessment. Uh, I'm thinking, for instance, I organized last year a research clinic on land rights, which I conducted with a couple of students in which we did a literature review on land rights that was a starting point for research that I'm developing now. Uh, and students also have their final um, capstone, which is a bit of a larger research in which they also conduct research. And some of them, I, I had one student last year, for instance, I had two students doing empirical work uh, back in their countries, doing all kinds of interviews for some time. Uh, and one of them is now in the path of even publishing or trying to publish her thesis. So they really do a lot of research and that for someone interested in research, the opportunities are many. Can I add to that, Anne? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I just want to emphasize because, again, I think that uh, just to highlight maybe a way that LUC is unique is that um, I wanted to uh, explain a little bit more what, what Bernardo just said about a research clinic. So he gave an example that you have research opportunities in, cor in courses. That's true. I think quite a lot of courses at LUC will allow you to do uh, research. And we have research methods courses, um, which, are, which are also throughout the program. Um, and we have the capstone. But I think what is, what is quite unique is this research clinic. And what that is, is that, is that um, we uh, faculty can decide that we want to get a bunch of students together to work on a, on a on research with us often it's on related to the kinds of research that we're doing and that and you come on board um you come on board with our research projects and it counts towards right it counts towards ecs to 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 do a research clinic it often works that um, we advertise research clinic positions at the beginning uh, of the block and students sort of apply to them. And then we select um, students to come into the research clinic. And these can be, these can vary in sizes. You can be doing a research clinic with uh, just two, two or three students. I've seen also that there are research clinics with a, with a dozen. Um, so that's a really cool feature of LUC. Yeah, I think that's really nice. It's also uh, probably the people here in the meeting will have different experiences. Maybe some people are really interested in research and have already thought about it. Clearly someone asked, but maybe there's also students who are completely new to that. So um, it's one of the options. And this links actually nice to, uh, nicely into the question of Lucy uh, about other stuff you can do at LUC. And she's asking about a semester abroad. Uh, is it possible to do a semester abroad? And has anyone done it? I don't think anyone here. Katrina, did you go abroad for a semester? Uh, no, I didn't. A lot of my friends did, but I didn't. Was it easy for them to arrange? Yeah, I mean, I I don't know if it's changed since I was there, but it was a very clear structure. Like, you know, when you have to apply and then you have access to the Erasmus partners, to the partners from Leiden University, and then also LUC specific ones. And then there's an application process that, of course, I didn't do. Um, but I think 
I don't know. I think about half my year went on exchange. It was it was an empty semester from my perspective. But uh, yeah, so I think it's relatively easy. Yeah, it's a pretty common thing or very, very popular. Jill, I think a lot of your friends are at the moment also on exchange, right? Yeah, definitely. So um, it is like that's what what happens usually. So in your third year, you'll have a um, your first semester will be kind of a free semester for you to choose what to do. So you can decide that you're going to exchange. And there's a lot of different partners, like really all, all over the world. Uh, as Katrina said, like all, all of the, you can go to universities that like all universities that have partnership, a partnership with like the university. So those are really lots of them. But um. But you can also uh, use that semester to um, to choose a, mi a minor, to do a minor um, at LEC, at the college, or you could also do a minor or take classes at any other Dutch university, really. So there's a lot of opportunities that you can um, um, yeah, make use of during that semester. And now I don't know if you said it, but Daniel asked if you can also do an internship as part of your studies. Did you say something about that for that semester? I didn't really, but yeah, so you you can do it. Um, um, it will also, I think, usually fit during this semester. Um, I'm not sure how many credits you can get for it. And I, I do know that um, unlike um, study abroad, I don't think you um, have support from the university. So you, you do have to, you know, reach out to the institution or uh, organization or whatever um, to to set up your your own internship, but you can definitely get credits for it. But yeah, I'm not the most knowledgeable about that. Well, I think it's good to give an, at least an idea of the possibilities, right? That uh, uh, we actually just had a meeting with someone who was doing a part-time internship. So at least it's a way to get experience, even if you don't get credits for it. Um, I see that there are a couple of questions that have come in before. Don't worry, I have seen them. Uh, a lot of them are more practical and fact-based, but I want to kind of use the panel. So that's why I'm going a bit more in-depth. And I see that Kao has asked um, the current students and Katrina what their favorite class is or was. So maybe we start with you, Katrina. Uh, yeah, I think I have, I have two. Um, so there was public diplomacy that I took with Giles, who's now the dean. And that was just a class that like, I think it wasn't even my top choice for the semester and then it was a real like aha moment and then that ended up being completely what I focused on for the rest of my time at OEC it's what I wrote my capstone on and then it's what I did in my master's um there was a super interesting class we were looking at yeah uh ways um of public diplomacy so that's diplomacy towards the general public um so for example we went on a trip to get a tour of the American embassy to just see how they presented themselves to us. Um, so that was really fun. And then the one that I think I refer to the most uh, is Nations and Nationalism, um, which pretty in the name, I was just exploring like different concepts and ideas around the idea of um, nations and statehood. So, I mean, it's just super relevant and it really, it's something that I apply all the time in my life, not just like in work or academically, but just when I'm reading the news or when I'm thinking of my own identity. And it was really fun. So very cool. And we'll make sure to pass that compliment on to our dean. Mm -hmm. Sebastian. For me, it was um a global challenge it was one of the most interesting courses that I had ever taken, which is the global challenge, the, the fourth one, which is prosperity. It just offered a very nuanced yet very uh broad at the same time perspective on development, which is something I would like to do later. Um for a master's degree or, 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 or maybe in the future. Um, and uh, the other course that I really, really enjoy right now is called Medical Anthropology, which is specific to my major. And you're also tackling like, for example, problems of the past and how to apply it in order to better understand anthropology and, and the medical side uh, behind it. And it's, it's, it, it offers a lot of perspectives. And I feel like that's the best part about the, these courses that it's really, it's not black and white. It offers um, a lot of um, different viewpoints where you can tackle these issues. Uh, it's really, really interesting and it's super, super fun. And I'm sad that it's, it's almost over the class, but I, I enjoyed my time. There's more wonderful classes to come. Yes. <laughs> what about you, Jill? It's actually a really hard choice because uh, you, you take so many classes. And, uh, but I think, 
uh, the one I've liked the most so far was uh, historical approaches to environmentalism. So uh, it was kind of like we were uh, studying how um, the history of environmentalism has been written uh, uh, over time. And it really made me question, just it made us all question, I think, uh, just dominant ways, very Western ways also, in which we tend to think about sustainability and, and, and environmentalism. So it was really cool. Okay, fantastic. Um, we got a question a while back. Do students commonly join one or various Fortuna committees? Who wants to answer that one? I'm thinking, Sebastian, yeah? Yeah, well, uh, this is from the perspective of someone who is a chair of a Fortuna committee. I'm the chair of Filmco, so that's basically our film committee. But other than that, I'm also part of other committees, but this doesn't necessarily mean that I attend to their events all the time because Fortuna gives you the option to attend whenever you want these, to these committees. Or better said, these committees give you the opportunity. So for example, fiber crafts, sometimes uh, to crochet or to knit or do pottery, visual arts to draw and paint. Sometimes I join those, those events and they're open to everyone in LUC. It's not because you joined at the beginning that you have to keep going. It's, it's very flexible. Um, and I'm also part of the Language Cafe. Uh, and even outside of Fortuna, other committees, the Race and Ethnicity Committee, which is also part of Leiden University College, um, part of DISC. It's also, uh, of, again, flexible. So you really have a lot of options, a lot of committees to join, and you're not uh, kind of, uh, it's not compulsory to attend everything, but in your free time, it's really, really nice to also go and see what they offer. Awesome. I saw a question come in that is for Bernardo. The combination of the program with law, so when you do the international justice major and you want to combine with Dutch law, can you talk a little bit about how it works, the basics? Uh, yes, so we have a double degree, uh, we have a double degree program with a law school in which students can do the LUC doing the, the IJ international justice major and then also at the same time doing the law school program so at the end at the end depending how they manage their program can be four it can be four and a half years or five end up with two degrees. So with an LUC liberal, uh, liberal arts and sciences degree and the law school degree uh, from, from Leiden University. The, there are a couple of, of um, there are a couple of uh, uh, steps in the application. The main one is that you need to speak Dutch. That's the main requirement. And then if you do the IJ, you can get credits in the law school and you get credits in at the LUC from the, the courses you do in the law school. So it's a, a shorter way of getting two degrees. Perfect. So that might be very interesting for students who are considering that option. Do you also see students um, who don't speak Dutch pursuing a law degree after completing the international justice major? Do you Have you seen any alumni do that? Yes, they work. I, I had a couple of French students that they were doing that. They were doing the LUC, but also doing a, a, a law degree in France and getting some credits in, uh, in France. They had to arrange the the accreditation of some courses in their law schools back in France, but they were doing that too. All right, I think that's uh, nice and hopeful for students. I remember we had an alumna join an event once who did a master in environmental sciences and then did a master of laws as well at Columbia University and qualified for the bar in the US. So there's a lot of different pathways that people take. Yes, and that's the other thing that a lot of students do is that even without a, um, a law degree, just through IJ, they get in, ma in law-related masters. So they don't qualify for professions. So in some professions, you need to have a law degree, but to get in a law-related masters, you not always need a law degree. And IJ students, many of them end up doing that. 
All right. Thank you so much. Now, there are a couple more factual questions in here, so I'm going to fire off some of them to, uh, to help answer those for the students who are waiting. Um, Sherry was asking, is the tuition fee for EU students lowered in the first year? I believe that is still the case. It's not the institutional fee, just the part that is uh, the EU tuition fee. So that's about 2,500 euros. You will receive a 50% discount if you are an EU student one time. Um, so only in the first year. I do believe that they are thinking about taking that away, but that's uh, for the future. Um, let me see. Mona was asking, support is provided. How much do students make use of this opportunity? Maybe one of the students or the alumni can talk about what type of support you've used, or maybe you don't feel comfortable. That's also possible. Yeah, sure. Jill? Um, oh. Yeah, so um, there's, uh, I think, two different, that's how I usually um, divide them, there's two different kinds of support. So there's uh, academic support and, and, and also personal support that's offered um, by the college. So um, like on the academic level, you can, um, I think I kind of mentioned it earlier, like you can go to study advisors and, and academic mentors. So those are professors and they can um, guide you through your interests, but also help with more administrative things and whether you're taking all your classes and everything. And then there's personal support and um, on a personal level, um, I think generally what's nice to know is that you have um, student life counselors. So those are actual therapists um, uh, on, on campus who you can go to. There's two of them. And yeah, as a student, you have free access to them. I think twice a block uh, is the maximum or twice a semester. I'm not sure. But yeah, you can always reach out to them. And that's a nice resource. And then there's also a team of uh, RAs. I don't know how much um um you've talked about it today and or we covered yeah. it very briefly okay. yeah. yeah yeah so there's resident assistants those are senior students uh who stay on campus uh or like living in in the residential uh, on the residential floors and those are kind of like older siblings that you can um uh, talk to but then they're kind of also a first point of contact uh so if you need any anything any kind of help also medical help um if there's any emergency they're always there also to kind of um link you to um internal but also external uh, uh support systems yeah. all right thank you so much um i want to swing around and uh ask the uh wonderful staff members that we have here some questions so um maybe for caroline since you were also involved in global citizenship at LUC, there's a really uh, a, a synergy between what happens inside and outside the classroom. Can you talk a bit about what that's like and why we do that? Sure. Um, uh, this, well, so the, I mean, I guess the synergy takes the form of uh, lots of the lots of the coursework that you're doing um uh, or many of the courses um do connect to uh to issues within the immediate environment whether it's uh, the Hague or the Netherlands in general and i know that uh, there are quite a lot of, as the global citizenship coordinator, one of the things that we're working on also is sort of streamlining the policy of excursion-based courses because it's something that we do a lot. Um, we have a focus on, we would like uh, uh, to get students, you know, you spend a lot of time in this building, <laughs> you, you live here and you have classes here. Um, but I think uh, uh, we're quite committed to getting you out of the building um, and getting you to connect not only with the larger university, so um, um, and, and fostering and facilitating context within the larger university, but also through coursework, doing and engaging with um, with the Hake, with the city as your new city. So my my little breakout session was on a, for example, a global citizenship course that I run called Struggle in the City, which is focused on students really spending a semester working on a struggle that people have in this city, and uh, really trying to. Um, uh, uh, understand um, and promote recognition 
for these struggles, empathy um, and outreach. What is the landscape of social protection here for, for people struggling? So I think in many different ways, um, uh, we, we try and uh, foster and facilitate you to get out there. Um, to make real um, the things that you're learning in the classroom immediate, get you to practice the kinds of skills that you're learning here at LUC immediately before you move on in your next steps um, in new different types of communities um, all over the place. Before you become global citizens, we train you locally. I think that's very well explained. And there's actually a follow-up question sort of related to global citizenship. Well, sort of, yeah. Anne-Marie is asking, what are the options for students who want to learn another language? Yeah, so as uh, we've got quite a few language courses um, available. And at the moment, in, they are indeed part of the global citizenship space um, because of the idea that global citizenship is about learning the skills of cross-cultural communication one of those. Um, so yeah, there are quite a few uh, languages on offer. And I know I think we're also trying to, uh, uh, to, to, to push and facilitate the learning of Dutch for uh, international students also to get you uh, to, uh, to move around uh, well in, the, in, your, in your new environment. All right, perfect. Well, we are getting slowly towards the end of the Q&A session. There are still a few questions, so we'll take a few more minutes to answer them. So if you have any last questions, pop them in the chat now. Um, a very practical question, Mona is asking, what exactly is the campus fee and how is it different from rent? Sebastian or Jill, do you want to answer that or should we ask Maarten? Sebastian? Yeah. So the campus fee, how it differs from rent, that's the question, right? Yeah, what is um, it and how is it different? So the rent, first of all, is a, is a, an amount of money you pay to, towards the landlord, not towards the university, and our landlord is duo. While the campus fee is uh, you pay to, towards the university to, um, for example, ensure, um, if I'm not mistaken, that everything is clean, that everything is organized, that everything is also um, how it's supposed to be. So that money is put into that. Um, and yeah, so the difference is between one is goes towards the university and the other one doesn't. And the rent you pay continuously each month was the campus fee you pay once a year whilst living in the building. Very clear. Um, I don't know if you know this question, but Daniel asked a while back if you can uh, take out Duo's tuition fee loan for this program because it costs more than the standard ones, or do you only cover the tuition fee and not the institutional fee? I didn't know the answer, so I don't know if one of our students knows. Um, it only covers the tuition fee. Okay. Um, so the institutional fee, it, it would have to come from your own pocket. Um, however, there are certain standards or certain criteria that you have to meet in order to get the student financing from the Dutch government. For example, a basic uh, requirement is having a Dutch nationality. And if you don't have a Dutch nationality, but you still wanna get the student financing, you have to be an EU national with the EU nationality and work a certain amount of hours per month. And then you can also uh, benefit from all the privileges that Dutch students have. For example, free transportation during the week or during the weekends and also student financing. Maybe someone can pop the link to Duo in the chat so that we have the answer there. I really like the question from Caho that just came in. So I really want to ask the panel that one. Um, Katrina, what do you think is unique about the people you meet at LUC? Oh, that is a really good question. Um, well, I guess there's two parts of that because one of the classmates, so my friends. Uh, so I quite like them because they are my friends. Um, but I think like, Everyone who comes to LUC has a certain driven interest because of the global challenges. So, you know, a lot of my friends, you know, have very international perspectives. They very much came with an interest in trying to tackle one of the challenges that exists in the world. And I was debating it with my friends recently. All of us have gone on to jobs that like, even if it doesn't like directly link to our major or it's still in the realm of global challenges, like, everyone is still, you can see that that passion has carried through. Um, and then in regards to the professors I met, the lecturers, I mean, 
or incredibly bright, incredibly interesting, very good teachers, like very high quality of education. Um, and also just like very, very friendly. You're on a first name basis with most of the teachers. They're very willing to help you, to support you. Um, there was a lot of flexibility given. So I did two research clinics actually, um, and rather misguidedly decided to do them in the same semester, which was also my last semester. So I decided to write a capstone and do two research clinics. I still don't know what I was thinking, but the academic staff really helped me through it. Like we sat down and we worked out how to make the schedule feasible and it turned out to actually be quite easy. And I know like a lot of universities would have just said, no, like you can't do that. It's not allowed. So yes, yeah, long answer. Yeah, but it's very uh, nice answer, I think. Caroline, you want to add something? Yeah, from maybe from the teacher's perspective, <laughs> what we think is uh, is unique about about you all is uh, so. I just uh, I think as some as uh, Sebastian one, uh, Sebastian or Jill mentioned, it's the last uh, day of the block today, so some of the courses uh, have come. Oh yeah, it was Sebastian medical anthropology. Um, some of the courses have come to a close, and mine has. I was teaching a coming of age in Africa course in the governance, economics, and development major. And um, it's indeed a sad moment to say goodbye to like the community of students. And one of the things that I did was give them back the their assessment or their feedback for participation in the course. And I think it's quite unique, remarkable, like wonderful that I can write to each and every one of my students how much I valued them in, in, the, in the learning experience um, and, and really mean it. And really I, like point out um, aspects of, of what, they, like, what they did and how they were that really contributed to everybody learning. Um, and so I think there is this sort of commitment to come into uh, courses with a real eagerness and openness to learn and to create a community among each other um, to foster that and to make that like a safe space for 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 us to grow. Um, and so I find that really quite special about LUC, LUCers, LUC students. Bernardo, do you wanna add anything from your perspective? I love this, uh, yeah. All these well, after Caroline's is is difficult, but uh, well, I I also teach every now and then at the law school, and one thing that for me makes a big difference is at the law school ends up being much more of a lecture. At the LUC, I I bring the topics and I give them to students and the class goes like it goes in all kinds of directions in all kinds of ways and I always value a lot the the how much I learn with LUC students it becomes a much richer uh, relationship because this environment of 20 students eager to learn makes you learn too with them so I really notice the difference I, in comparison, and it's always a pleasure to, to engage with students at the LEC. Yeah, I think this is a really, uh, the way you guys describe it is very nice, and it, I hope people will get a feeling of what it's really like. I want to go towards a wrap up, but I'm curious if anyone wants to say any final words, if you have any advice from the students who joined today, if you uh, have anything that you want to tell them, anything you think we've missed, feel free to raise your hand panel members. And otherwise we will go towards a wrap up. Maybe Sebastian and Jill want to say something about the people here. No yeah, I, Jill? I think from my part, um, I think um, many of you might be considering applying for, like for the early bird, that's why you're here, or like it doesn't really matter, but maybe you're applying this year. And uh, um, yeah, the applications uh, process, the application process can be um, uh, a bit uh, tiring. There's a lot that you have to send in, but I think um, for my part, I just, uh, it sounds cliche, but that's what I always say. Just try to be uh, genuine and, and keep it 
personal and try to show the admissions office uh, who you are through your motivation letter and and the curriculum curriculum that you also build and um, yeah just um, make it yourself because um, that's kind of what they want to see uh, who you are uh, and where you come from what's your context uh, what's your background uh, and um, yeah I think that's the, the advice I'd like to give. <laughs> Uh, and for me, it's uh, to, to add to that because it's so true. I would also say that um, just advice in general, just the academic and the social life of OUC, the student association, and the courses are, have all been really, really interesting and really, really great so far. Also, um, the building, uh, not only the building, but also more broadly, The Hague as an international city, it's also really nice to live in. And, and it, I w well, from personal experience, these years have been really great. Um, and yeah, the University College really has a lot to offer. So if you're interested in that, um, the application is lengthy, as Jill said, but it's definitely worth it. Yeah, maybe also don't be intimidated by it. I think uh, that's definitely good advice for students as well, that it is a bit of a chore, but, you know, don't be intimidated by all these stories. We are looking for different people with different backgrounds and different stories and not just unicorns, um, so to say. Weird, weird word to end this on. But I want to um, thank the panel for your fantastic answers and for giving such a vivid insight into LUC. Also, uh, Caroline and Bernardo for your fantastic lectures. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. And we wish everyone uh, of our panel members a lovely weekend. The students, of course, are going to stay because we have one final uh, program item here. Um, so I want to introduce just the final part. And let me actually start sharing my screen for that. Everyone is waving. Thank you. There we go. Of course, now my screen share is loading, but there we go. So we are reaching the final uh, bit of our uh, online experience day. So what you have now is two choices. If you really want to stay here and learn more about admissions, stay in this session. Martin will take over and he will answer all your questions that you have on mind. I saw that two questions came in for our panel, but uh, we were already in the process of wrapping up. So if there is time, Martin will try to answer those as well. Make sure you pop your questions in the Q&A um, because that's where we are monitoring the questions. However, if you would rather go on a live campus tour, you can uh, scan the QR code and join us on Instagram. If you want to watch on your phone, if you want to watch on your computer, you can go to instagram.com slash LUC The Hague. I will write it in the chat in a second as well. Um, so one of those two, I have asked the students who are doing the live campus tour to record it as well. So you can watch it later if you want to. So you don't have to think of this as Sophie's choice. Um, but yes, for those of you who are ready to go to Instagram, scan the code. Um, at the end of the Instagram tour, if there are still questions going on here, you may return to this meeting and otherwise we will say goodbye to you here and you will wrap up with our students on Instagram. So thank you so much for joining. We will share the recording uh, with you afterwards. And I'm going to give the floor to Martin. Yes, thank you, Anna. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can Perfect. hear you. I'll leave the screen up for just a few more seconds for those yep. people who need to scan the QR code, if that's okay. And then after that, you can take over screen share. Yep. But uh, yeah, take it away. Yeah, I can already start talking, of course. Oh yeah, I mean, if you want to. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, I thought I would, I would wait, but it's fine. Um, so for everybody staying, uh, thank you. <laughs> We have been talking for quite some time, so thank you very much for the final part of uh, probably your attention streak. Um, so this part will uh, I will deep dive on admissions. So I'm an admissions officer. I uh, uh, I will together with my colleague Yolanda will look at your applications once they come in uh, and evaluate them. So maybe it's handy for those of you who don't know for sure uh, uh, in depth about our admissions process. Uh, I'm just going to start from the beginning. Um, and of course, any questions that you have about that are, you know, deeper than on surface level websites, let's say, 
um, I will also answer them for you uh, in the Q&A at the end. I think 25 is the number that will stay on, Anna. Um, I think I so too. Yeah. And I see myself glitching in my camera, so that's going to look weird, but there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah, but we can hear you very well. So. Yes, the, <laughs> don't look at my camera too much. Um, <laughs> yes, let me set up quickly the screen share. One sec, please. Uh, this is it. Can you see it? Yes, right? Out of, uh, yeah, perfect. All right. So how to apply to LUC. So I'm going to tell you a bit about the application procedure, how we select uh, what comes after submitting your application and some frequently asked questions. So right at the beginning, so the application window is already open. It's called StudyLink. It's a national platform where you can uh, apply to up to four programs in the Netherlands. Uh, so once you apply for our program, which is called Liberal Arts and Sciences Global Challenges, once you apply, you get a code to activate your account, uh, which also mentions your student number, and then you will be redirected to the application portal uses, as, as it's called. Um, so I already told you in the presentation, we work with two deadlines, the early bird deadline and a regular deadline. So on the 1st of December, which is already in less than two months, <laughs> Um, we, uh, that's the deadline for the first, uh, selection round, so to say, so the, no, no, yeah, the first selection round. And as I said, uh, before we don't select differently for the early bird and regular rounds, but there is a difference in, you know, how you experience your own application process. If you apply to multiple universities, for example, it may be nice to know, uh, if you have been selected for Leiden already before hearing the news for example, let's say a university in the United States. Now, we look for a specific kind of student at LUC, and maybe it's good to know that an LUC student is all of these things uh, that are listed, but not every student is the perfect student, right? Uh, so an LUC student is at least one of these things listed here, I meant, so not always all of them. Uh, but we look for a certain fit in the community, right? So the, the program in liberal arts and sciences, it's a whole different program than just a regular uh, study program, such as psychology, such as mathematics. And there's nothing wrong with these programs, of course, but liberal arts and sciences is so fundamentally different that we need to know for sure that you are the right fit before coming here, right? Um, and the characteristics of that liberal arts and sciences program is somebody who enjoys an intensive program, who enjoys a social and community life, who is broadly interested, right? So who's willing to tackle global challenges, but also uh, is willing to explore the program, combine different disciplines, um, right? And, and when, somebody who wants to engage in and outside of the classroom. So if you identify with at least one of them, broadly interested, usually is a very good indicator that you, that this is the right program for you, that definitely don't be shy to make an application. Uh, you've seen this slide before, but I'm gonna tell you anyway again. So for an application to LUC, we use uh, a different selection process than uh, the regular selection programs in the Netherlands. So you have in the Netherlands something that's called numerous fixes, which is an, a program, a bachelor program with a limited amount of spaces. Um, and they have their own selection process. And there is a general deadline on the 15th of January where all the numerous fixes programs uh, 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 start their selection but a university college in the Netherlands is a kind of special selection program meaning that we have our own autonomy to uh, create our own deadlines but we're also not a numbers fixes program so we're also we are selective we can select our own students but we are not a numbers fixes program so if you um, had a question about that uh, there's your answer so we have our own selection process and we work with uh, different kind of documents that you need to submit for your application. So for example, you need to submit your transcript so we know how you are doing academically. If you need to make an English language test, you need to submit that. Um, we have a motivation letter that you need to fill in. So most of, the doc these, of these documents have already a, a pre-made LUC format, such as the motivation letter. 
Um, so in that format, you can see that we already have the questions listed there that, and we just want you to answer them. Um, and with these questions, we can see, do you understand uh, what you're applying to? How motivated you are? Have you already looked a bit in depth at the college, for example, right? So that's what we're looking for in the motivation letter. Um, and experiences, we test your experiences by, uh, so there is something that's called the LUC form. And in the LEC form, you um, write down your current uh, situation, let's say. So uh, are you still expecting to receive grades? Uh, do you meet the mathematics proficiency, which I'm also going to tell you about, don't worry. Um, and there's a section to tell about your uh, uh, experiences that you have as a student, but also in life. Uh, for example, extracurricular activities, or if you like to uh, play an instrument, play sports, do a hobby. If there's something worth noticing uh, um, that you want to write down, the LEC form is the is the way where we can check. Oh, this person hasn't been sitting in uh, on their own on the couch, right? Uh, that's essentially what we're looking for. So, if you have submitted your application, the following will happen. You will be uh, checked if you are admissible with your diploma and then the admissions office. So me and Yolanda will review all of the documents that you have submitted. And then there is an admissions interview round where you receive, you, so you receive an email if you have been selected for the admissions interview round. So some people are not selected, unfortunately, uh, but you will see, receive an invitation for the admissions interview. And the interview basically is a 15 minutes a uh, personal online interview. Uh, so you'll receive a link uh, and you will talk with one of our academic staff members uh, uh, for 15 minutes. And it's more of a, a dialogue kind of, it's not a question and ask uh, uh, interview, but it's more of a dialogue where you will be tested on, can you think critically? Can you think on your feet? How do you respond to, to some questions? Can you see the other side of the debate, so to say, right? So it's more of how you will behave in the classroom or how you are as a person. Are you interested in, in, in hearing each other's opinion, for, so, for example? So um, it's always difficult to uh, prepare for that interview, uh, uh, um, but it's good that you know on what kind of abilities you will be tested on, right? So that's, that's mainly the interview. And then the final decision will be made by the Dean of LUC. Now, I've already written down some frequently asked questions just to uh, uh, just to anticipate on that. So I'm just going to go over them one by one, one by one. So how many students apply each year? We have about seven, eight hundred applications, seven to eight hundred applications uh, every year. And the acceptance rate is one in three. Right. So we have place for 200 students. Not every student uh, that receives an offer starts. So that makes the acceptance rate about one in three. Um, thus applying in the early bid round increase my chances, uh, not per se. So advantages of applying early is knowing the answer more early. If you want to make use of uh, scholarship or financial aid, you need to apply by the early bird deadline, but keep in mind that scholarship slash financial aid in the Netherlands is limited. Um, and there is a chance that if your application is, uh, isn't good enough to receive an interview invitation in the first round, uh, because there are limited interview slots, um, then the admissions office can make the decision to uh, uh, move you over to the second round. But that's only in some cases and by invitation of the admissions office. So it's not a guarantee. Um, what are my diploma requirements? So I, I would say that um, in-depth diploma requirements per diploma, I'm not going to list. There is a website. So on a website, you can find the diploma requirements per country and per uh, common diploma. So definitely make use of that. But I just wanted to use this question that um, the diploma requirements listed there aren't always a cutoff point. So there, are, there is a minimum uh, amount of academic requirements that you need to obtain in order to make an application or in order to be admitted to Leiden University. Um, but there is also a higher liberal arts and science, sciences requirement. And we feel that that requirement meets the level that is taught here 
at LEC. Um, so the higher you get above that grade for liberal arts and sciences, the higher your chances are of getting in, but it's not a cutoff point. So for example, we say that 33 international baccalaureate points are meeting the level that is taught here at LEC. But if you score below 33 points in IB at the moment, you can still make an application to our program. For example, if your motivation letter is very good or you have lots of noteworthy experience in extracurricular activities, for example, you can still be a wonderful addition to our cohorts. A question commonly asked, is mathematics necessary? And we say yes and no at the same time. So this is very important and sometimes a bit confusing. Um, mathematics is a standard part of, uh, of the curriculum that is taught at LEC in some way or the other. So in your first year, you will receive a mandatory mathematics course that all students need to take. And that is the level that we think that uh, students should have. So pre-university level mathematics usually is the requirement that we ask to students to have before they come to our program. Of course, depending on which stream you go into, if you go more into the sciences side of, of things like the environmental science, you will be dealing with more and more complicated mathematics. If you go into world politics or IJ, international justice, uh, there's less mathematics that you have to deal with and more reading, for example. Um, so mathematics isn't a hard requirement. It's not a mandatory requirement to get in, but it does weigh a bit in uh, the selection process, uh, meaning that if you don't have mathematics on the desired level, um, um, the admissions office will take that into account, so to say, right? So it doesn't, it's, it, again, it's not a hard cutoff point. If you don't have the level, you can still get into the program, uh, um, but you do need to be aware that there is a level of mathematics that's being asked. And if you have that uh, when entering the program, then you'll have likely no issue. Uh, if you don't have it, you may be struggling. Uh, so that's something that needs that you need to keep in mind. Um, and yeah, the last question, the content of the interview, I already covered. Um, if you're unsure about anything, please send us an email. We're very responsive on the email, so admissions at lec.lightingunif.nl. Uh, we usually react very, very quickly. Of course, if you send us an email on the deadline at 5 p.m., um, that's going to complicate things, right? So start early with your application. Uh, uh, but if you're unsure about anything, do not hesitate to send us an email. So that's the deep dive for now. I want to dive into the questions now. Um, I will first start with answering the, uh, the questions that are already in the Q&A chat. If you have questions, Additionally to this, do not hesitate to ask them. So Sandra was asking, are there mathematics requirements to apply? I would very much be glad if somebody from staff could uh, put the requirements in the chat so you can just have a look at them. But again, mathematics aren't a hard requirement to get in. It's not a cutoff point. All right. Uh, Mona asked, what is the number of students intake per year? So we have a physical limitation due to the rooms that we offer of 200 students per year. So the first and second year students live in the building and we have room for 400 students. Ariana asks, is it possible to hand in a recommendation from a teacher in German or Spanish or does it have to be in English? All documents need to be in English. Uh, transcripts that are in a different language, so let's say you have a, an academic transcript that, that is in Spanish, you need to translate it to English officially. Uh, transcripts in French, German, Dutch, or English, they can stay that way, but other transcripts have to be uh, translated. But the recommendation letter or the motivation letter or the LEC form have to be filled out in English. If your teacher cannot speak English, have them translated by the English teacher of your school, but your, your recommendation teacher needs to send it, right? So they can give approval, for example, that your recommendation letter needs to be in English and needs to be sent by your recommendation teacher. Um, there is a question about research clinics and I'm not sure if I can answer that. So sorry, Sarina. Uh, I'm 
<laughs> Elisa asks, are all students required to turn in their school reports or can international students only turn in the national exam scores if they have any? I'm not sure if I understand your question correctly, but I'm thinking that you're saying um, if it is okay to uh, send transcripts while you're still in school. So yes, um, once you make an application to LUC, you need to send your scores that you have obtained at the moment and then uh, uh, submit your application. So we can do, so the admissions office knows how you are doing academically at that time. And we can make an estimation how, you, how good you will do uh, for the rest of uh, of the year, for example, right? So the admissions office can ask you for updates and to upload uh, a new list of transcript uh, of grades later in the year. Um, but if you don't have most students that apply to the program don't have their national exams yet because they need to make them half half a year later. Uh, so we ask for their school reports uh, uh, at the moment, right? I think I hope that is your question. Um, Capucine, you have a question about the difference between IRO and global challenges. So that's not admissions related. So I'm going to skip that. I'm sorry. Um, Elisa, you are saying, I read that there's a hundred euros application fee in StudyLink. Can you apply for three programs in each university? But can you apply for two regular programs and also the liberal arts program? So I believe that there is a, a, hundred, a hundred euro application fee per university. So if you make an application to, let's say, Leiden, then you need to pay a hundred euros to make an application to, for example, archaeology. Now, if you want to make an additional application within Leiden for international relations, you can still, uh, you have already paid a hundred euros application fee, but this does not apply for Leiden University College, we have a separate uh, application fee of 50 euros. So if you only want to make an application to Leiden University College, you only have to pay 50 euros. If you want to make an application to archaeology in Leiden or archaeology and international relations in Leiden, you have to pay 100 euros application fee. If you want to pay, uh, if you want to apply to Leiden University College and archaeology in Leiden, then you have to pay 150 euros. So keep that in mind. Uh, Lucy asks, how long does one have to decide on acceptance of application? Is it possible to change this decision afterwards? Uh, good question, uh, Lucy. So usually uh, we give students about two to three weeks, depending on where we are in the application uh, process to decide if they want to start. Um, part of the acceptance of the uh, application is paying the campus fee as a deposit. And if you decide to withdraw your application uh, before the 1st of May, you can get that deposit back. If you decide to uh, change the acceptance after the 1st of May, so if you decide to withdraw after the 1st of May, uh, then the deposit has already been uh, covered in costs such as uh, administrative costs to housing, et cetera. So keep that in mind, uh, withdrawing after the 1st of May does have consequences. Anna Marie is asking, does the admissions office count it against an applicant if they have stopped any extracurriculars in their last year of high school for various logistic personal reasons? Um, so Anna Marie, obviously, if there is an anomaly or something that stands out from your, uh, from your application, there's always room to give context for that, right? Either via email or via an additional upload in your application por in your in the application portal, uh, if you desire to do so, right? So um, it is important that if there's some if there's something we notice in the admissions office, um, we don't know about your situation until you tell us about it, right? Um, so that's maybe uh, important to keep in mind. Uh, if students have, for example. Uh, uh, stop their program. They started a program at the university, but they stopped. Um, it's always good to mention that, for example, in your motivation letter, why you stopped. If, uh, maybe there was something personal. Maybe the uh, it wasn't interesting enough. Maybe you went to the, went traveling around the world. 
um, it tells something about you, right? So make sure to include that. Uh, Lucy asks, is there a time limit time limit on Cambridge English proficiency test? If so, where is it stated? Are there any exemptions possible? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, that's something that Cambridge uh, can answer for you. Um, so I can't help you with that. Uh, I'm sorry, Lucy. Um, so any exemptions on making an English test depends on the diploma that you obtain. If you have to make an English test, then there's no exemption possible, unfortunately. Serena is asking, is admissions rolling? So if we, if we apply in October, will we hear back earlier than if we apply on November? Um, kind of but we don't call it rolling, but we do process applications as they come in. So if you make an application in October, you will likely hear it uh, more earlier, but we try, because we have a limited amount of places, which we, we are comparing applicants, the strength of applicants uh, to one another. So it could be that your application, uh, uh, that you will only hear about your application a bit later in the process, right? So it's a yes and no question. <laughs> Uh, Rujuta asks, can you have more than one recommendation letter? Um, we only process one recommendation letter, so it's not possible, unfortunately. So I'm sorry about my camera. It looks very funny, I see now, but <laughs> hopefully, hopefully I'm doing well. Um, let's see. Adele, does the master program application also work via StudyLink with the same requirements of the bachelor's degree? Yes, so StudyLink, uh, is, you can also apply for a master program in StudyLink. Uh, Rujuta asks, do you ask for predicted grades or only transcripts of examinations that are already done? So our admissions office can only make hard uh, decisions on the grades that you have already obtained. So some students by the 1st of December deadline haven't received a transcript yet. Um, and how they then need to uh, finish their application is filling in in the LEC form when they will receive their first transcript. And then the admissions office will uh, ask them to upload it once they have it. So some students only receive their first grades in January. Um, so that also means that the uh, admissions office can only look at or make a final decision if you are selected for an interview after we've seen your actual grades. Predicted grades, they differ too much per um, per high school. So we have decided that that's not uh, uh, the best way to um, indicate how well a student is going to do. You can always upload it, but it's not a mandatory requirement. Uh, the application deadlines are both before I receive my high school diploma, end of March. How can I apply with, without disqualification, ask Anna. So you upload your school reports or transcripts, as it's called, uh, um, up until the moment uh, of uh, uh, when you receive a decision, right? So I'm, you say high school diploma, so maybe you mean your U.S. high school diploma. That can be so some U.S. high schools, they... Uh, give a quarter school report or an autumn report. So you can upload that already. Uh, uh, and then the admissions office can ask you or email you to upload more uh, uh, proof of how you are doing at the moment uh, while the application is still going on. So we don't need your high school diploma yet because most of the students that apply don't have a high school uh, diploma yet. Uh, but we need to know how you are doing academically uh, throughout the year, right? Uh, Kaho is asking for the extracurricular activities section on a motivation form. And am I correct to in interpret that applicants could also, sorry, could also include past activities that they aren't necessarily engaging in at the moment? Also, is this section looking for our engagement with societal issues or and are extracurricular activities personality-wise and hobby-like? Um, yes to both of them. So keep in mind that we are interested in uh, something that you are doing relatively 
uh, not too long ago. So if you did something in junior high school, like six or seven years ago, that may be less interesting than something that you are doing for the past years throughout uh, your high school, for example. Um, and you can put in, in that section, anything that you find relevant enough for the admissions office to know, right? So it could be engagement with societal issues, but it could also be personality-wise, things like hobbies. Um, Adrian is asking, do you have any recommendations on what the admissions office would like to see in terms of recommendation letters? Should we ask teachers in certain subjects that may be more relevant to the LEC program, or should we choose a more personal approach with teachers who know us better and can speak towards our personality and motivations? I would say the latter, Adrian. Uh, so more about personality and motivations. And we have a recommendation form that asks uh, the teacher why you would be a good fit for liberal arts and sciences. So we do expect the person writing the, motivate, the recommendation letter to know you and to know why you would apply to a liberal arts and sciences program, right? So keep that in mind. And uh, last question, Vilarni asks, how does the mathematics grade transcripts need to look like? So it's, um, we ask for a transcript of you uh, that just states the name of your mathematics course. Uh, and that will be sufficient to prove your mathematics grade. So it's not a, a specific transcript that only lists your mathematics grade transcript. No, if you have a transcript that lists all of your courses, including mathematics, that's sufficient. If you don't have mathematics in your final year, you need to write that down, including a so-called math plan in the uh, LUC form. So all of that is explained in the LUC form. Um, and there's also the option to do an external test to prove your mathematics proficiency, the OMPTA test it's called, which is also listed on our website. All right, that's all of the questions uh, up until now. I'm not sure until what time was this meeting, all the, uh, Anna? Until five? Yeah. It is until five, yes. It is until five. So we have yeah. six more minutes to get some more questions in here, five more minutes. We're yeah, I was down. trying to answer Capucine's question. I was, I was typing a really long answer, but I think someone already answered it. Oh, the, about IRO and, and global challenges. Ah, yes. Um, actually, maybe we can talk about it a little bit because it's a complicated question. Well, Anna, there is actually a, a, a very relevant question still answered or asked All right, here go for from, it first. <laughs> from go Lucy. For it. So if my transcript of 2023, 2024 will not be available before February, February can I not apply for early bird? Um, good question, Lucy. So February is a very late time to receive your uh, first transcript. So um, please ask your teachers if it's possible to receive uh, a transcript earlier than that. But yes, you can apply by the early birth and then indicate when your transcript will be available. However, that also means that you will receive an answer if you've been invited for an interview or if you have been selected at all, very late as well, right? So keep in mind that until we have your transcript, we cannot make a decision yet for, let's say, the interview, for example. Uh, so keep that in mind, okay? All right. Yeah. Do you want me to take a stab at the IRO question? Yeah, please. So Capucine asked, at the end of the three-year bachelor, how would you define the differences in terms of opportunities and assets between the IRO program and the Global Challenges program? This is a very difficult question. Um, and it came in just at the end of the Q&A. So it was a bit difficult to ask the panel. Ultimately, there's not one way to answer that. And uh, our colleague Yolanda also advised you to chat with the different students and explore the websites. But uh, maybe we can try to attempt to answer this a little bit. Um, first of all, let's look at the programs in question. International Relations and Organizations, or IRO, is a program within the political sciences discipline, and it's part of the School of Social and Behavioral Sciences. So they will always take uh, elements from social and behavioral sciences and infuse them in the political science point of view. Now, of course, if you look at both of the programs, you can see a very big practical difference, which is that within LUC, you have a lot more flexibility. So ultimately, you might end up choosing a world politics major in LUC, which means you focus a lot on political sciences as well, just like you would do in IRO, but you have more flexibility to get there. 
Now, in terms of outcomes, that's even a more difficult question for us to answer because uh, generally students are uh, very likely to do a master after they do a bachelor. So the master is more your specialization. And what you also saw in the example from our alumna that we had here earlier, Katrina, is that a lot of different things can determine where you end up going. It's not just the bachelor that you enroll in. Um, it's also the extracurriculars that you do, the master program that you do afterwards. How active are you? Um, how do you come across in interviews? So you as a person, whether you choose program A or program B, are going to uh, probably, uh, if you really have an, an aim in mind, for example, if you want to work for international organizations, you can get there with both the programs. It's not like one uh, excludes it from another. It's more about finding uh, a type of study program that suits you best and that gives you the opportunities to develop that side of you that you are most interested in um, to kind of get you towards that goal. Um, so when you look at, for example, where alumni go, you see that students both from Leiden University College as well as from a program like International Relations and Organizations might end up as diplomats. But you can also become a, a diplomat after you've studied economics. Um, so that is that's why the, the question is so difficult to answer. So what you can look at is uh, anecdotal evidence. And I would also advise you to determine what type of student are you? So are you looking for an environment like Leiden University College where you live on campus and where there's a lot of extracurricular activities um, or where you have a lot of flexibility to put your curriculum together? Or do you prefer a setting that is more stable or, well, not stable is the wrong word, is more set where your curriculum is determined beforehand? I would take those things into consideration and maybe look at what type of master's programs people have gone into. And I think that will help you determine uh, the best path for you. I know I took a lot of time. Sorry about that. This is always a very difficult question. So I'll give the floor back to Martin uh, for the last few questions that came in. Yeah, I see two more questions. So for Lucy, uh, uh, still related to your previous question, uh, could the transcript from last year be applied in my case? Uh, so transcripts from the previous year need to be included. Uh, that's, a, that's a mandatory document. Uh, but it, we also need to have your uh, grade A transcript from your uh, final year, because your final year will reflect uh, the, the level that we expect <laughs> at LEC. So our requirements are related to your final year in uh, in high school. So we also need to see a transcript from that, right? So we use your transcript from last year as reference, but we need a transcript from this year as well. So Serena, uh, if a student were considering a gap year, should they apply in their final year of high school and defer, or do they need to apply during the gap year? Uh, you cannot defer in this program. So for most programs in the Netherlands, except for the numbers fixes programs and our program, for example, you cannot, uh, uh, you can defer, but for numbers fixes programs and our program, you cannot defer. So if you apply now, but want to take a gap year, um, then you need to go through the whole application process the year after again. So, um, and the application process also changes every year. So. Uh, uh, it's better to apply during your gap year because then you also have more additional extracurricular motivation, for example, that you can apply. So it only benefits you if you are taking a gap year at least. Uh, Elisa, I think that's the final question and then we'll wrap up. Um, are the transcripts for all high school years or only the final grades? Uh, so we require a transcript as is listed on our website, by the way, um, a transcript from the previous year and also your final uh, high school year. Uh, so we don't need your whole high school history of uh, all, all of the six years, let's say, if you are in, in, in the Netherlands, for example. We just need your uh, final two years. So this year and previous year. All right, that's it. Lots of talking, uh, but you were such a good listener. So thanks. Do you want to wrap up, uh, Anna? Sure. Yes, I think that is a, a good idea. In fact, I think I actually had a slide. Well, no, not really. If you want to come uh, see LUC with your own eyes, you are very welcome to do that. We have an in-person open day for Leiden University on the 4th of uh, November. So you can then also visit other programs. So particularly for the students who were looking at 
uh, comparing different programs. You can sign up for different sessions. Our sessions are in our own building, so you will also get to see that building. Um, if you cannot make it to that one, we have an, another in-person experience day at the end of November. The content will be very similar of what we did today. Um, so it's more if you want to see the building. And we also offer individualized campus tours if none of these events work for you. Um, I think Maarten already stressed enough how early our application deadlines are or how quick they are coming up and uh, the benefits of applying early bird. So once again, thank you so much. Those of you who stayed all the way until the end, you really deserve a medal. Uh, you are now released to um, go enjoy uh, a drink, a pause, uh, maybe have some food. And uh, we look forward to possibly meeting you in the future. Thank you so much. <laughs>